Hey, this is Coach Boyson, and today we're going to be looking at the classification of life. In our last video lecture, we looked at the three domains of life. Now we're going to look at a little deeper in how we actually classify them according to this system. Uh, specifically, how do we give each organism on this planet a name in this system? A guy was key in this. Uh, you see his wonderful picture there. I love those clothes he's wearing. Uh, his name is Carlos Linnaeus. Now this guy was a Swedish botanist. He loved classifying things, and one thing that he really gave us that we use today is going to be a naming system, and it's based off of, we'll talk about here in a minute, called the genus and the species of an organism. So as humans, we're called Homo sapiens uh, because Homo is our genus and sapiens is our species group. Uh, he called this binomial nomenclature, meaning it was bi meaning two, nomial meaning name, so it was a two-name naming system. And so he was the one that got this all rolling. If we look through history and time, you can see this thing has changed many times. You'll notice Linnaeus over here on the left, his classification was fairly simple. Vegetable or animal, plant or animal. Uh, now what's key about his system was he didn't base them off of evolutionary relationships, he was just basing them off of physical characteristics of these organisms. And as we move through this system, it is developed and it's constantly changing and developing. I'll probably be teaching something different next year. Uh, to where it is basically covered based off of evolutionary relationships now. So we try to classify organisms by not just similarities, but evolutionary similarities and relationships. And Woese came up with this system back in 1990, and it took a while, but scientists are slowly, more and more scientists have adapted this idea of a three-domain system uh, that we talked about with the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Uh, than any others. And so what's key about this system is it is based off of evolutionary relationships. Now the goal of this system is, is a tough goal and it's one of called monophyletic grouping. What I mean by that is this. We have a phylogenetic tree. If we were to look at this point right here, we would want this to represent a common ancestor to everything else above. What I mean is we would want everything within this grouping right here to all be able to relate back to this common ancestor. So here, 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 and here. This is called monophyletic grouping. Now it wouldn't be good, you can see this would not be a good system if this organism related back to this ancestor, this one did, and then this one had very little or no relationship back to this ancestor. That would not be a very good grouping or classification. So we want to keep this thing monophyletic, working in one direction and being smooth there. Now the challenge with that is this, and this was Linnaeus's challenge. If you look at these two bugs over here on the left, we have a pill bug and a pill millipede. Now if you saw those two, I know if I saw those two, I would probably classify those in the same group. Linnaeus would have classified them in the same group. The problem is, is they are pretty different, all right? And you can see obviously they have two different scientific names there. What's great, this, this is obviously a challenge to our system, what's great that what we have today that he didn't was this thing called DNA. Now DNA has given us the ability to look at organisms even closer and find those evolutionary relationships. You know, when we were uh, studying evolution, we looked at a thing called amino acid sequencing uh, for DNA relationship. We looked at how close a human, gorilla, chimp, uh, as opposed to say a human and a horse were based off these relationships. And so DNA has really been helpful for us. And so but I wanna pull up this picture here. If you look at this picture, um, this is actually a phylogenetic tree of primates. And uh, you'll notice if you look at this tree, if we wanted it to be phyl or a monophyletic, again, whatever this common ancestor down here would need to relate to everything above. Another thing that you can notice by looking at something like this is this. We have, there's us as homos. You have the pan, which includes like the chimpanzees, and you have the gorillas and these. What this would allows us to do with DNA relationships and amino acid sequencing, we can, we can tell here that we are more closely related to this group, including the chimpanzees, than we are the gorilla, the pongo, so on and so on. And so again, this, this system is trying to push towards that. And DNA has really helped us in looking at these similarities where Linnaeus didn't have that information to begin with. Now, let's look at how we classify this system. All right, it is a hierarchical system starting with domain and we are going to work down. So the next one down is gonna be kingdom and then we're gonna, underneath that we're gonna have phylum, class, order, family, and then genus and then species. 
Now, one thing you'll notice about my upside down pyramid here is that it gets smaller each time. What I want you to understand about this system is it starts broad and it gets very specific. So when we start at domain and we say eukaryote, well, there is a lot of organisms that fit into that group. Now, if we narrow it down and we go to kingdom, well, that gets a little more specific. All right, now we're talking about animals or we're talking about the plant kingdom. We go even further down to phylum and class and then order and family. We go more specific each time. So the diversity within each group gets less and less as we go down through this system. You're gonna to need to know this for the test. You're wondering, how am I gonna remember this? Let's take a look at this. What is this picture? This is uh, my fun little picture of a bunch of kings playing cards. So you say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, take a look over to the left. We have dumb kings play cards on four green stools. Now, again, you're going, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if we look over here, we have D, domain, K, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So again, I rephrase that. Dumb kings play cards on four green stools. Get this image right there locked into your head. If you remember that image, you'll be able to remember the phrase. You remember the phrase, you know your hierarchical system. So uh, that's one easy way to remember it. So to finish up today, let's look at this. I have in the bottom right an organism. And so we're going to classify him. Now you may call that organism a cougar. That would be a common name. Some people call it a ghost cat, a panther. There's all kinds of common names for this organism. But for us to classify this organism to where scientists can universally study it, we have to give it a scientific name. And so let's kind of roll down that. This cougar is a eukaryote. Its cells have a nucleus. It's in the kingdom, animal kingdom. And you'll see there the word is animalia. Uh, these words are actually written in Latin, meaning uh, they come from a form of Latin, which helps us keep it universal. I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, it's a chordata. All right, I mean, it has a spinal cord. It's a mammal. Its uh, order is carnivore. Its family is a family with all big cats. Genus is puma, and species is concular. So its scientific name is going to be a combination of this genus and this species right here. That would be its scientific name. So its scientific name would read as puma concular. And you'll notice I capitalized the first letter and the second, or the first letter of the first name of the genus and of the species I lowercased uh, the, the C there. And it's also in italics. That's how we write scientific names. So puma concular. So what is so important about this system? It is universal. What does that mean? It means somebody speaking French over there in France, I could say puma concular, we'll say if they actually study taxonomy, and they will know what I'm talking about. If I walked up to them and said, hey, that ghost cat over there, they would not know what I was talking about. And so by using this language of Latin, which is a, an ancient language that's no longer really used by any uh, grouping of people on this planet anymore, we can keep this thing universal to where all of us can study it. So if I publish my findings, somebody over there in Europe or any other language, German, uh, could be able to look at those findings and understand what it is I'm talking about. So hopefully that was helpful. I'm Coach Boydston. That was the classifications of life.